All right, everyone, so Dr. J here, and we're gonna be finishing up this particular presentation on drone or UAS regulation. Uh, before we get back into the regulation, I just thought I'd point you to the Pilot Institute, which is a great source of news on uh, drones and UAS. Uh, also, Wired.com has uh, some news articles about drones. So a couple good websites to check out, the YouTube channel and the um, video cast or podcast for the Pilot Institute and then the wired.com set of news articles. So we're gonna jump into next remote pilot requirements. The remote pilot in command is the main pilot which is in charge of a particular uh, UAS mission. The remote pilot in command is responsible to verify that the UAV is loaded properly prior to flight. This involves both weight and balance con considerations and, it must, and the RPIC must make sure that the uh, UAS or UAV is ready to fly and is properly loaded. So if you've made any modifications to the drone, if you've added any payload, then you're required as the remote pilot in command uh, to make sure that those are legal. The remote pilot in command must have a part 107 certificate in order to operate the US, UAS. So this is the part where you need to pass the part 107 exam. And then once you do that, you'll receive a certificate from the FAA, which authorizes you and they do send a temporary certificate right away, um, and you can download that and use that temporarily until your official certificate comes, but they'll send you a certificate and that will be your proof that you've passed the Part 107 exam. Uh, and that of course is the prerequisite for receiving the certificate. Now, the remote pilot is actually different. I can highlight this here. The remote pilot may be different than the remote pilot in command. The remote pilot must either have a Part 107 certificate or be under the direct supervision of the RPIC, the Remote Pilot in Command, who does have the certificate. And I'll we'll say more about this. Uh, so the Remote Pilot in Command must be able to immediately take over the controls from the Remote Pilot. So you can actually have uh, a student, for example, someone who is still learning about drones or how to fly drones, and who hasn't passed their Part 107 exam yet, they can still fly um, under uh, Part 107 conditions as long as the remote pilot in command is right there and immediately able to take over the controls if needed. And there are three ways to accomplish this. One is, and the most obvious, is that the remote pilot in command is just simply standing beside the person controlling the aircraft and can directly take the controls if needed in an emergency situation. The other way, two ways are less common, but they have been used, they can be used, I should say. Uh, one is to use a buddy box system where you actually have two controllers and uh, that allows the remote pilot in command to take over using the second controller. Um, and then you can use an automated system to automatically hover or return to home. Uh, and that can also count uh, if the remote pilot in command is able to immediately take control and do one of those two automated things. So the remote pilot in command is the one responsible for the mission, for the flight uh, of the UAS. Um, but another remote pilot is able to control the aircraft as long as the remote pilot in command has immediate control or the ability to immediately take over control. Registration. Registration is required for all drones which are less than 55 pounds. And of course, 50, less than 55 pounds is what's covered under part 107. There are no exceptions for small aircraft. And this is a point of confusion I've seen online and other places. Um, if you're operating under part 107, all drones, no matter how large they are, must be registered with the FAA. Now, if you're oper operating under um, the exemption for recreational users, so in other words, if you're just flying a drone for fun, only the drones that are 0.55 pounds and greater need to be registered with the FAA. So for small, small craft and only recreational use, you don't need to register your drones, but for all other cases, you need to register. And also, uh, kind of an aside, but persons under 13 must have another person. So if you're under 13 years old, you need to have someone else register your drone for you. Uh, the registration number must be easily readable and displayed on the outside of the aircraft. This is a newer regulation that the FAA has introduced. Uh, what I have done is I've uh, got some stickers on the outside of my aircraft. It has both the registration number and the expiration date for the registration. Registration lasts three years and registration costs $5. And as I said, last three years, not calendar years or calendar months, by the way, from the date of registration, but the actual dates. So if you register your drone on March 16th, you'll need to re-register that drone three years from March 16th. Um, and I, I say here, 
It's recommended that you put the expiration date on the registration sticker on the drone so that if someone else is using your drone, they can immediately see, yes, this drone is registered, yes, it's legal to fly, and they can go right into it. Uh, part 107.15, conditions for safe op operation. I'm going to go quickly through this. This is kind of just common sense type things. You need to make sure that the UAS is in a condition that allows for safe operation. And you can't continue to operate a UAS once it's no longer able to be safely operated. An example would be you're in a flight and your battery is getting pretty low. You need to bring the UAS back, charge the battery, kind of common sense type stuff. Don't operate the drone when it's not safe to be operated. Um, medical conditions, part 107.17. Now, no person may act as, an, as a remote pilot in command, a visual observer, or a direct participant if he or she has a mental or physical condition that could interfere with the safe operation of the UAS. So some examples that are given here, um, basically uh, imagine uh, alcohol, drugs, any even medications uh, that have precautions not to operate heavy machinery or drive, anything that would impair or interfere with your ability to have clear thinking, uh, clear situational awareness, is going to be uh, something that you shouldn't do while you're acting as a drone pilot. Um, so for example, if you have even something like a migraine headache, which is can, could really interfere with your concentration, that would render the uh, uh, person unable to perform uh, SUAS operations. There's another uh, specification in this uh, regulation which says that a hearing or speaking impediment that would preclude the remote pilot in command, pilot and visual observer from communicating is enough to keep uh, a mission from, from proceeding. What this basically means, I, I think, is that essentially if you have a team, you have a pilot, you have a remote pilot in command, you have a visual observer, maybe you have several visual observers, the entire team needs to be able to communicate with each other. They need to be able to say, look, someone's coming, look, I see an airplane. They need to be able to communicate. And if that is not able to happen because of any kind of condition, between the members of the team, then you need to reevaluate and put um, individuals in, in place that can actually communicate. And something to just emphasize again here is that the remote pilot in command is always the primary party responsible for communication and for safe operations of a particular UAS mission. The remote pilot in command is the one that has the responsibility for making sure things are done safely and making sure all the members of the team can communicate and for making sure that the aircraft is in safe operation and for making sure that the person flying the aircraft has the proper skills for doing so. This remote pilot in command must be designated before or during the flight of a small un unmanned aircraft. What does this mean? So in general, you would want to designate your remote pilot in command before the flight. Um, in some cases where you may be, uh, where you have dual controls, you might be transitioning remote pilot in command during the flight. So that's what that is referring to. Um, the remote pilot in command is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of the small unmanned aircraft system. This text, by the way, is directly copied and pasted from the regulation. And the RPIC must ensure that the small unmanned aircraft will pose no undue hazard to other people. In other words, the remote pilot in command has responsibility for the operation, complete responsibility, and will be held liable if things go wrong. Um, and this is actually the last slide I have for you for this presentation. So again, just to summarize, the remote pilot in command, the RPIC, is always the primary party responsible for communications, safe operations, the drone operations, everything about a particular drone mission is, is going to be the responsibility of the remote pilot in command.